Hello everyone, this is Kevin Madison with Project Dragonfly and this is a short video about testing your comparative question. So one of the biggest steps is figuring out what your question is, um, but once you have your great idea and you're really excited, maybe it's looking at inquiry-based lessons and if they're more effective than traditional lessons, maybe your question is, does a restored meadow have higher biodiversity than an unrestored meadow? You might look at, does behavioral enrichment for animals at a zoo uh, decrease stereotypic behaviors um, before or after, after the enrichment? So those might be your comparative questions. You're really excited, but then the next step is, how do I test this? How do I really come up with uh, an experimental design that will get at this question and give me some results that are, that are useful? So in terms of experimental design, one of the first things you, you can do is, is go to the literature and see how other researchers have investigated this topic. This may help you refine your question to really focus on an area that maybe has not been as well investigated, but it also might give you some method ideas, some variables that you need to watch out for that are, that are confounding variables that you need to be aware of, or maybe just some setup in terms of what types of questions you can ask or how you how many people you might need to survey or talk to or how many plots you might need so all of that can be great so definitely doing a solid literature search and then you really want to think about as you approach your system and where you want to do your work how can i integrate replication into my study and also how can i integrate randomization in my study and i'm going to talk about why those those two r's are so important replication and randomization so uh, why replicate? Say you're, you're interested in tree diversity, and in this case, the yellow star there is Peabody Hall, the, the offices of Dragonfly at uh, Miami University. And you can see that um, down in the lower right of the slide, there's actually a forest remnant there, and then there's also the main campus area um, to the left that is the more manicured lawns with uh, trees interspersed. So say you're interested in how many tree species there are in each of those locations, the forest versus the campus, and that's your comparative question, which has um, more tree species. So you decide to sample trees and, and identify them in this uh, fixed point with a radius of a certain, uh, certain radius, and because you can't go and count all the trees and, and identify all of them to find out how many species. That would take way too long, so you need to sample. So that's your plot A, that's the forest, and then you do the same in the campus, uh, and that's your plot B. And if you just stop there with the one, a sample size of essentially one in each of your two plot types, well, you come up with, say, some data that there's, well, in the forest, actually, I found five tree species, and in plot B, I found eight tree species. And, well, you can't say much at that point because it's it's... It really could just be a function of what's happening in those two small locations. And it may just happen that plot A of the forest happens to be in a, an area that is mostly maple trees for whatever reason, and there's not much else there. Um, and the same for the campus. It could just be randomly be a, um, a, a higher species richness area. So you need replication to tell you a little bit more about what's going on. And so if you had three plots now in each of the, in the campus and three in the forest, you can actually then get uh, an average or a mean for each of the plots. So say your average is 4.6 species for the forest plots. And you can also get a sense of variation. So standard deviation can be calculated, which gives you a sense of, of spread of how much variation there is around those averages, around those means. And so that starts to tell you a little bit more of a story about this, this uh, system because you might be able to say then, well, campus plots actually had a higher average in terms of number of tree species than the forest, but there was less variation. The standard deviation was lower. So what does that mean? Well, maybe it's that on campus, the, the horticulture department actually plants the same seven or eight tree species uh, throughout the campus, and that's kind of the standard setup. And um, so, you know, you start to get to, to, to learn some, some things about the management of these two locations, and you can develop further questions to figure out what's going on.
So why randomize? Well, if you uh, didn't randomize the location of those plots, if you just did what was convenient, maybe you follow a path into the forest that goes down the hill and you just choose your plots because they just one after another, well, the problem there is pretty obvious. You're really just sampling within one section of the larger forest, and that might be on a ravine or an area where, or by a stream or something, and, and maybe the tree species are different there than if you had of had a more even um, um, sampling of the, the rest of the forest. And the same for campus. You might just be sampling in a corner of the campus that, for whatever reason, has a different setup in terms of tree species. So it's good to randomize and have your plots located throughout and interspersed throughout as best as you can um, your study area. And this is also the case if you're looking at human subjects in your you're randomizing within, um, say, students in a classroom. Maybe you want to look at inquiry-based versus traditional lessons, and you want to see if, if I give inquiry-based lessons, do those students do better in terms of their the learning outcomes? And so uh, you're trying to decide who, which students are gonna, going to receive that inquiry-based lesson. Maybe you flip a coin, and you start out, and you flip a coin, and it's heads, so that's maybe means inquiry-based lesson. So the first person on the top left is going to get an inquiry, and you oh, randomly flip the coin again, and uh, it's heads again, so there, there's another person there that's going to be inquiry. And actually, I did this, and um, I ended up flipping five heads in a row, which in this case would mean those, those top five individuals are going to get the inquiry-based lesson plan. I then flipped two tails, and then another head, and then two more tails and another head, and that resulted in seven students out of 15 that could re receive this inquiry-based lesson. Um, and the other eight would not. And it's, and it's fine that it's uneven because we're going to just be looking at means and averages. Um, so I did this in a random way, although when you look at this, it doesn't look very random. Um, and this is an important thing about randomization. It can be tricky. Um, so say then you, you do your study and afterwards you look at the learning outcomes and the, the, those that received the inquiry-based lesson actually scored higher than those that conducted the traditional lesson. And you're excited and you say, that's due to the inquiry being more effective. Well, maybe, but um, not necessarily. It may be that those at the top just happen to be, by chance, your higher achievers in the class. Maybe this middle row is the medium achievers, and the bottom row is the lower achievers. If that's the case, it wouldn't matter what lesson plan you gave, probably. Um, those the, the, the folks, because you have so many higher achievers that are receiving the different lesson plan, that treatment, um, they would score higher. So in this case, you can use something called the randomized block design. This can be useful for any experimental design setup where you're trying to get rid of some sort of confounding variable. In this case, it's their, their previous level of achievement uh, that you know. Um, so you might be able to group them, high achievers, medium achievers, low achievers, and then randomly select within the high achievers two students that will get the inquiry-based lesson. You randomly select in the medium achievers three that'll... Uh, get the, the inquiry-based lesson plan, and then two in the low. So now you again have seven that are getting the inquiry-based lesson, but it's more evenly spread out among their achievement level so that you can feel more confident if there is a difference that it is actually due to the inquiry-based lesson and not their previous um, level. So, um, so really, coming up with your question is only the beginning. The, the next step is really thinking about how can I get at this question with a really sound experimental design. And replication enables you to stay, say a lot more about your topic because you can include variation. And you can also start to then use statistical tests like t-tests and other things to really look at the data. Randomization is really important. It helps remove bias. Um, so that you're not just, sometimes as experimentalists, we can end up going into an area that is higher diversity, say, or selecting students that, even without knowing, this can be subconscious level. So adding an element of randomization, it helps us fairly sample in a fair manner um, the, the, the area and to take our own judgment as an observer, as a experimenter out of the equation. And then a randomized block design can be used to reduce the influence of confounding variables on your study. So you can certainly set that up. I hope this has been useful, and uh, we'll talk soon.